So welcome back to our fifth and final episode this week. If you're just now tuning in, this week in honor of Brain Awareness Week hosted by the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, we are releasing an episode each day with a guest. We will be interviewing someone on a specific topic within neuroscience. So on our final episode, we have Anna Hodges with us here today. So Anna, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Yes, thank you for having me today. My name is Anna Hodges. I am the Manager of Programs for the Knoxville Office of the Alzheimer's Association, which is the national organization dedicated to care and support for those living with Alzheimer's disease, but most importantly, funding research. Um, we have got an office in just about every major city in the country, um, but of course here offer care and support locally. Um, I've been with the association for just over six months now, but of course um, am interested in Alzheimer's after having lost my own grandmother to the disease uh, about 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so when the position became available, I thought it was the perfect way to kind of reconnect with her and, and um, give back to my family in that way. And in the process have really found something I'm very passionate about. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So tell us more about why the Alzheimer's community education is um, so important, especially here in Knoxville. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess you already explained, like you got involved through your grandmother, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I felt this connection to the cause for a long time without really understanding much about it. And as I have become more involved with what we do with the association, I'm realizing that families all over the country, but particularly here in East Tennessee, are generally unprepared to deal with Alzheimer's. And so those who begin to face it, it's not something that sort of creeps up on you, it's something that blindsides you. And you realize my entire world has changed, my plans for the future are completely changed, and in general, people are not prepared to handle it. And so it's a disease that we, that does not get an, quite enough um, awareness and we don't talk about it quite as much. So we think of cancer as being this very widely discussed um, condition. And so when someone comes home and they, they say, my loved one has been diagnosed with cancer, we say, what kind of cancer is it? What doctor are you going to? What treatments are you taking? And we're very involved and we put together meal chains and the neighborhood comes together and, and all this. But what we're finding is that people who come home with an Alzheimer's diagnosis find themselves isolated, friends and family and neighbors begin retreating because they don't know how to handle this diagnosis, they don't know how to offer care and support. And so the family is, aside from feeling isolated, don't know how to prepare financially, don't know what their options are for long-term care, and don't know how to adjust to a new relationship with a person who is changing and changing rapidly and changing in ways that is very difficult to um, process and deal with. So like you said, uh, some people might not be able to understand like the specific struggles that the individual diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease is going through. So can you tell us a little bit more about the struggles that those individuals go through? Absolutely. So the first thing I want to do is clear up some misconception about what Alzheimer's is. Um, I think it is widely believed that it can, is a personality disorder or it's a mental illness or it's a psychiatric condition. And in fact, it is a physiological change in the brain. So it is an abnormal buildup of proteins. Um, that cause real problems with neurons in the brain being able to communicate effectively with each other. So when someone is acting out of character, it's not that they're having a psychological episode, it's that their brain is no longer functioning properly. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to understand that as a concept, first of all, to help eliminate some of the stigma associated with Alzheimer's disease, um, but also to, to help just deal with the, the concept that this person is changing. Some of the personality changes that we see, some of the more disturbing symptoms have to do with, with personality changes. So someone who has been very caring and sweet and kind and loving their whole life may turn into a little bit more difficult person to handle, someone who mm -hmm. is more agitated and fearful or they become suspicious and paranoid and maybe they begin to accuse their own family members of stealing from them or causing them some kind of harm. These are the, these are the symptoms that are not talked about as frequently with Alzheimer's, um, but can be the most devastating because it mm -hmm. damages that relationship so much. So it's important for someone who is caring for someone with Alzheimer's disease to understand that this, these symptoms are not a reflection of the relationship, mm -hmm. but a mm -hmm. symptom of the disease. And that is a really tough thing to understand. 
Um, it's, it's one thing for me to sit here and say it, but I certainly know that if my mother were to come home one day and first not recognize me and then accuse me of stealing from her, it would be devastating. Mm -hmm. And having someone say to me, don't worry, it's just a symptom of the disease, would not make it easy. Oh, right. And so we're not, we're not saying don't worry, everything's fine. We're saying understand that this is not a reflection of how that person truly feels or felt about you. This is a reflection of the damage that's going on in their brain. Mm -hmm. Uh, taking it further with mm -hmm. um, the relationship and family members or um, other caretakers, well, mostly just family members mm -hmm. with um, little or no knowledge of Alzheimer's, like how do they um, fall short on their mm -hmm. caretaking methods and how do they, um, I guess, like what strains do you see, especially in those relationships? This is one of my favorite things to talk about because this is um, the conversations I have with people that I think most commonly elicit those aha moments. Mm -hmm with family members who think of Alzheimer's as a second childhood. We hear that expression a lot, which bothers me because when we're raising a child, we are teaching them to prepare for the future. We're teaching them right from wrong. We're teaching them decision-making skills. But when we're dealing with someone with Alzheimer's disease, the capacity to learn those things is gone. And so what I find a lot of times with family members is that they want to teach right from wrong and they want to confront delusions or hallucinations with fact and truth. And that approach is really only going to further exacerbate the problem and agitate the person. So for example, if someone says to you, I went and saw a movie yesterday, and you know for a fact that they haven't left the house in 18 months, rather than saying, no you didn't, dad, you were sitting right here the whole time I watched you, that's mm -hmm. just going to bother him. It's just going to upset him. You're calling him a liar. Mm -hmm. When if we were to respond to that by saying, oh, that's great. What movie did you go see? That's going to um, lead into a conversation. No, he didn't go see a movie yesterday. We understand that. But we can still engage in a meaningful conversation with him. We can still allow him a platform that makes him feel like a valuable family member. And so one of the things I hear a lot is, but I don't want to lie. Lying is wrong. Mm -hmm. And so I do a lot of teaching about the therapeutic fib and that it's, it's one thing to lie to your spouse or partner in a way that's deceitful or deceptive. That's not the same thing. When we are um, entering into someone else's reality with them to allow them space to feel comfortable, um, that, that's a different situation. So we are encouraging someone to share with us whatever it is they're thinking, whether it's true or not. Because realistically, in his mind, he did go see a movie yesterday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, he may be thinking that it is, you know, 1964, and by God, he did go see a movie. And there's no reason to tell him that he's wrong in that moment. It's, it's only beneficial for both of us to take it as an opportunity to engage. Mm -hmm. Right. So I guess that part um, kind of falls into, like, the the differences in realities, mm -hmm. I guess, that um, the caretaker or the family member mm -hmm. um, is facing versus the individual with the Alzheimer's mm -hmm. diagnosis. Um, so I think you made a really good point about just like, uh, it's not really the same as mm -hmm. lying in a deceitful right. manner because exactly. you're still engaging in a conversation that's still meaningful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, One of the things I tell people is to look at it um, as though the person that you love has moved, right? Mm -hmm. So they're not gone. They're still there, you can still go and visit, but they're no longer living in the same house. And when someone comes to visit us in our house, generally we're gonna establish the rules. But the person that we're caring for can no longer come and visit us in our house. We have to be comfortable going to where they are in their home and following their rules. Mm -hmm. So if we're gonna to continue to have that relationship, we've gotta understand that what they say goes, Mm -hmm. um, even if it's nonsensical, and certainly we want to do what we can to help keep that person safe. You know, we don't want to allow them to endanger themselves or right. others. But if they're going to say something that maybe is a little bit silly, it's okay to go along with it. In fact, it's mm -hmm. the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so what are some of the options uh, for someone diagnosed with Alzheimer's in terms of the caretaker position? Mm -hmm. So um, would it be... Uh, an option to put them in a caring home or like a nursing home or hire a caretaker if uh, there's no one in the immediate family that can um, just kind of like stay home with them or um, just be with them and keep them company. What are some of the options in that aspect? So there's a couple of important points here. Um, the first being that it is imperative that we keep the person with the diagnosis involved in their own care planning for as long as possible. Um, so that's going to start as soon as there are concerns 
Um, and as soon as you can get to a point where you can have a conversation about, let's, let's start making plans for what we want the future to look like. I highly, highly encourage early on in the process to involve an attorney mm -hmm. to make sure that all legal plans are set in place. Um, you would be amazed how frequently cousins and brothers and sisters from you know, years previous suddenly start cropping up as soon as there's a, di a dementia diagnosis mm -hmm. mentioned. So that I would, I would highly encourage um, legal involvement, but also making sure that the person with the diagnosis is involved in their own care for as long as possible. Um, as things advance, it's very much a personal decision on the, on the part of the family and the person with the diagnosis. To what degree are we going to try to keep mom or dad or whoever at home? Um, at what point are we going to be comfortable talking about looking at a care facility? Um, what's important to us at, in that process? Um, certainly in-home care is an option. It's a good option. It can be an expensive option, um, but can help facilitate a person staying in their own home longer, which is a great thing. There are also some simple home modifications that can be done to make living um, aging in place a little bit easier. Uh, so you would advance probably from family caretakers to professional income caretakers to an assisted living facility to a nursing home. Um, someone with uh, more significant memory issues might consider going into a memory care unit, mm -hmm. which has got a little bit more stringent rules about who can come and who can go, and it's usually a locked facility. Um, and there are tons of professionals out there that can kind of help guide you through that process. I will say that the senior care industry is a huge industry mm -hmm. and is only okay. growing. Um, so one thing I encourage all my families is to shop around. Um, it's competitive. So if you find one caretaker or one facility that you're not crazy about, just drive down the road. Because uh, anyone who's driving through Knoxville these days knows that these places are cropping up left and right, and they are only getting nicer and nicer and nicer. Which leads me into um, another very important point that I think a lot of us at one point or another have had that conversation where we made the promise mm -hmm. to never, ever, ever put our loved one in a home. Right. Mom, right. I will never do mm -hmm. that to you. I'll keep you at home as long as I can. So help me God, I'll never put you in a nursing home. And that's a really unfair promise to make because mm -hmm. people generally say those things with no understanding of what it takes to care for um, a person with a dementia or Alzheimer's diagnosis. It is incredibly strenuous. It is tw absolutely 24 hours a day, and I mean 24 hours a day. We find that insomnia um, is a really difficult symptom to deal with that can be devastating to the family trying to provide the care. Um, and it can, like I mentioned earlier, it can get very expensive to keep someone at home. And really what makes sense is to turn care over to professionals, mm -hmm. someone who is paid to deal with someone experiencing these symptoms 24 hours a day. And these places are not like they once were, right? So we used to think of nursing homes as being these very cold, sterile, unwelcoming places, and that's just where you sent, you know, Uncle Paul when he got too bad, no one ever went and visited him anymore. It's just a lonely mm -hmm. environment. Um, and that's just simply not the case anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are getting nicer and nicer. I'm constantly going to ribbon cuttings and grand openings for some of these senior care facilities that are absolutely gorgeous. Um, and every time I go to one, I try to figure out what the minimum age limit is and where do I go to the list because they're just absolutely stunning. Amazing. And, you know, 24-hour room service and all private rooms. and. I mean, they're just they're they're beautiful. So my, my point is that um, I encourage people to not look at senior care in the same light that we've sort of always thought about it. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Um, so bringing it, uh, I guess, to campus, mm -hmm. this um, topic of Alzheimer's. Um, what are some volunteer opportunities that are available to students, or what resources can we um, uh, look into to um, help? Um, the greater Knoxville community sure. with this? So in general, volunteer opportunities um, are gonna center around um, major events. So our biggest event happens in October, and that's our Walk to End Alzheimer's. It's on October 13th this year. <laughs> uh, and we're always looking for volunteers to help kind of prepare in the days leading up to, and then of course, um, it's a huge event, so on the day out, we have a need for a lot of volunteers there. Uh, I am always looking for people to volunteer as support group facilitators, which is would be um, a bit of a responsibility, right? So that's an ongoing 
um, job we ask someone to take on um, to help people cope with um, a loved one with Alzheimer's disease. And I absolutely do see that being appropriate um, on UT's campus for a couple of reasons. <clears throat> Mainly that I think there are probably a lot of students here who have a loved one back home struggling with dementia or Alzheimer's disease. I know that when I was in school um, and my grandmother had Alzheimer's disease, I was very disconnected from it mm -hmm. um, and would have really appreciated being able to get together with um, other people who were in my same situation. Listen, I'm not a primary caretaker, but I have a loved one who's at home. I'm concerned about them. I want to learn more about the disease. I want to learn more about how I can get involved. So I think a support group or any kind of a group that would bring people together um, to, sh to share in this experience of having a loved one mm -hmm. um, with the disease. And it's, it's particularly pertinent to me to get the message out to UT students, to, to college students in general, um, because we know that one in three seniors will die with Alzheimer's disease. And that number is only going to grow because... Baby boomers are turning 65 every yeah, 10,000 yeah, a day, yeah. and these are our grandparents. These mm -hmm. are our parents. And uh, it can be a very lonely thing when you feel like you're the only person. So are you talking to your friends about if they've experienced any of these symptoms? Because more than likely, one of them, at least one of them, has. And where do they turn for care and support? Mm -hmm. So I would certainly encourage, um, you know, at least some kind of a group to get together to, to be able to talk about what it's like to deal with these, if not a, if not a support group. Um, we are always on the look for professional help in the office. Right now we've got more people signed up to intern than I know what to do with, which is a fantastic problem to have. But I would always encourage someone who's interested in getting involved to just contact the office. Um, we have got opportunities for people who enjoy public speaking to go out and give presentations about Alzheimer's disease. Um, so. What I tell people who are interested in volunteering is, you tell me what your interests are and what your time frame is, and I will find something for you to do. Uh, because there's there's not enough um, awareness in the community. So mm -hmm. anyone who can help with that would be more than welcome. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so yeah, you mentioned that you are um, working with, uh, like directly with like one of the chapters with the Alzheimer's Association, uh, correct? Yes, so I am, we are part of the Knoxville office, uh -huh. and the Knoxville office is part of the Mid-South chapter, okay. which encompasses all of Tennessee, all of the offices in Tennessee. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, if someone wanted to work uh, with a nonprofit group or do um, delegation facilitation work, similar to how um, you are involved with, um, what, what steps would they have to take to be directly involved with this? Like any sort of degree qualifications, mm -hmm. uh, any specific experiences, all that sort of stuff. Um, in terms of, like... Um, formal employment? Yes. Uh, so that's going to be based on whichever role is open. So the, the position that I hold now did require a master's degree, mm -hmm. um, and I would encourage a master's degree in general. So my background is in social work, um, but it's not exclusive to that field. Mm -hmm. um, but any, anyone with an interest or a passion in, in caring or helping, um, certainly communications plays a part in it. Um, there's an educational piece as well. So I, th I think that this the work that we do lends itself to a couple of different disciplines. And honestly, I would say the single most important thing would be a passion about Alzheimer's. So I don't mm -hmm. think someone who just has no connection at all, just needs a job, would be as effective. Mm -hmm. I really believe you have to have a, a passion for it. Um, so I, I think that, to me, would be the, the most important qualification. Right. right. Awesome. So yeah, do you have any additional information you want to tag on or any topic you want to talk about that we didn't touch on? The most important thing is to know that the Alzheimer's Association is hugely accessible. So we're available online at alz.org. Uh, we offer a 24-7 helpline, which is available at 1-800-272-3900. Uh, so someone's going to answer that line 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, um, and that will be a master's level trained clinician who's an expert in Alzheimer's disease um, and other forms of dementia as well. Mm -hmm. So we offer a number of other services, including care consultations. So that's going to be an opportunity for family members to come into the office, sit down and talk with me one-on-one. -on -one. Um, to do some resource navigation. Okay, here's a situation that we're in. 
what are my next steps? It can be a very overwhelming time mm -hmm. um, when you're newly diagnosed. So that's an opportunity to kind of come in and, and come up with a game plan. Mm -hmm. So I think care consultations are very important. We also offer um, educational programming. So anyone who has got a civic group, church group, school group, any group, a bowling league, any group <laughs> of people that will sit down long enough to listen to me talk, um, we have a number of different presentations that we offer, including the basics of Alzheimer's, the 10 warning signs of Alzheimer's, um, how to live to um, promote a healthy brain, um, how to be an effective caregiver. We've got a three-part series on, on caregiving mm -hmm. um, as a family member. So educational programming is a big piece of what we do. We offer a program called Trial Match, which is also available through our website, which is alz.gov. <laughs> I'm sorry, alz.org. And that um, trial match is a database that houses all of the clinical trials that are being conducted across the country and internationally as well mm -hmm. that are targeting Alzheimer's research. Um, so I think that is probably the most uplifting piece of information I can give people is that there is work being done right now today, some of it on this campus, um, to help find a meaningful treatment, prevention, or cure for Alzheimer's, which mm -hmm. is ultimately the goal. We have got some advocacy work that we do, which would be a great opportunity for volunteers to get involved with as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a sister organization called AIM, which is a 50C4, I believe. Uh, so they do some lobbying for us in Washington, but then we also have some advocacy efforts um, here locally. We just did had a day on the Hill a couple of weeks ago um, and encouraged um, a bill which we have drafted, which would make Alzheimer's disease officially recognized as a public health priority. Mm -hmm. um, right now we're hearing a lot in the news about the opi opioid crisis, which yes. is certainly an important topic. Mm -hmm. um, but what I tell people is that Alzheimer's um, is our next health major public health crisis. Mm -hmm. Um, and generally, what I say to people is that if you don't know someone who's affected by Alzheimer's now, you will soon. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't mean to sound um, morbid about it. I don't mean to be super depressing, right? Because there are lots of opportunities to get involved and make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, but it is important for people to understand now that this is coming. There is a tsunami on its way, and it is about to hit. Um, all right, that's good. Well, thank you so much for all of that information, all of the resources. Um, if you're looking to get involved in Alzheimer's at all, please visit any of the above website or any of the websites that were said right before. Um, so that concludes our series of episodes for Brain Awareness Campaign. And a big thank you to Anna Hodges for coming and talking to us about this. Thank you for having me. Yes, awesome. So if you're interested in learning more about the Brain Awareness Campaign, be sure to visit the brainawareness.utk.edu website for all the details. And thank you for tuning in.